we developed a bio-based sunscreen, okay? So it's bio-based, biodegradable, non-endocrinian disruptor. It's a novel molecule, but it is as efficient as the petrochemical ones, even more efficient, okay? And the remnants in the environment is 10 days, something like this, just in water. So it, it shows that it is possible to make equivalent functionality with novel molecules, uh, which are designed to be more sustainable. Hi everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Biomarket Insights TV. My name is Paul MacDonald and I'm delighted today to be joined by Cyril Pantianet, Chief Executive Officer of Avalis Biotechnologies. Hi Cyril, how are you? Hi Paul, I'm doing fine. And you? Good, good. Very well, thank you. And thank you for joining us on this latest uh, episode. So today's episode is entitled accelerating the ecological transition of the chemical industry. Our viewers are gonna be really interested to learn about the benefits of biosynthesis, the challenges facing the pharmaceutical, cosmetics, chemical and food sectors, the importance of brainstorming and lessons learned to help biotech startups. So lots of great stuff to get our, our teeth stuck into. So, about uh, Avalis Biotechnologies, you help companies in the pharmaceutical, cosmetic, chemical, food, and nutraceutical sectors to manufacture new or existing molecules in a sustainable and cost-effective way using synthetic biology. Can you give me an overview of the business, please? Yeah, with pleasure. So at Avalis, we, have, we are one of the leader in precision fermentation of microbial strain in Europe. And more precisely, our job is to make microbe. So we develop microbe that make the molecule that our customer need. And we're working for the cosmetic, pharma, food, chemical market, as you said. Um, we enable our client to broaden their product and ingredient portfolio with sustainable alternative, bio-based, renewable, sustainable, and, and all the uh, and biodiversity friendly as well. And uh, as a company, uh, we operate in uh, all the required field to, to be able to do that job. Uh, it's of course, a lot of genetics, genetic engineering, but also bioinformatics, fermentation, robotics, analytics, and uh, also some proprietary tool that we have developed over the eight years of existence. And uh, also a very professional service mindset um and uh really the, what we sell to customer what is really making our business is to develop novel precision fermentation processes for existing molecules or new to nature molecule or innovative functionality um and uh we the, the customer comes to us generally with one question like uh hello cereal i would like to manufacture this molecule that many tons per year that price and that's it and our job is to, to see whether it's possible, answer how it is possible, and then develop the microbe in the fermentation process up to uh, end of laboratory scale, and then end over to our client to upscale himself or to go to a manufacturer to upscale and, and produce for him. Great, and just out of interest, how long does it take, or this might be how long is a piece of string, but how long does it take from that inquiry from the customer to delivering them with the solution? So it, it depends on the complexity of what we have to do. Um, so for a certain molecule, like almost everything is known, uh, but the, the difficulty sometimes is to go around existing patents. So it, it's, it's not because it's known that it's easy and vice versa. Sometimes you have to go through a very complex enzyme discovery uh, procedures um, engineer novel activities, and it can take uh, very long because we've been able to engineer routes of uh, 40 steps. So uh, it depends on how much difficulty you have on every of the step. But generally speaking, um, the shortest would be around uh, one year and a half in our hands, and then uh, the necessary time for scale up and, and, uh, and production. Uh, it can take much longer than that. Um, to two, three years generally in our hand until we have like a really industrial ready process ready to upscale. Um, and then it's handed over to uh, those that does the job of industrializing and producing. 
which is again uh, taking time. So it's it's not a short process, uh, but it has certainly a lot of interest that we're going to speak about. Uh, yeah, great. And um, yeah, and I think you, I understand that you founded um, Abilis Biotechnologies in in two thousand and fourteen. So yeah. it'd be great. Give us a bit of uh, what is your background? What inspired you to create yeah. Abilis? And give me an idea of the the journey you've been over uh, over the last eight years. It's a long journey. Uh, well, first, uh, I am a chemist by training, uh, and I loved chemistry uh, when I was a student. Um, but then I went to the lab and I did my own synthesis, uh, and I realized that it was a shock for me because I realized how unsustainable it was, like the, the type of chemicals that I was uh, breathing or my, washing my hands with. And I said, well, is that really chemistry? This is, is that really how it is? Um, so I, I searched for another way of doing chemistry. Um, and then I discovered, um, it was in 2010 ish, um, that, uh, the, the Synbio and more precisely metabolic engineering, uh, existed. And there were people that were trying to reprogram microbe to synthesize the chemical that they need. Um, this is what we call at Abolis biosynthesis with my opposition to chemical synthesis. Um, and though I decided to switch career, um, I started uh, learning biology more in depth than I used before. Um, then I started my PhD. Uh, and during my PhD, I realized that um, at the time, uh, in 2014, um, there were little major company that were familiar with this type of technology. And there were also little company offering service to help them um, to develop and, and integrate that type of technology. Um, there were company at the time, uh, like Global Bioenergies, Metabolic Explorer, Ameris, they were producing their own chemical for themselves, but they were not developing for third party, third party per se. Um, and uh, so I decided to make, to make my own. Um, and um, we, I think it's one thing that is quite unique about Abolis is that we started from the very beginning to have customers. Mm -hmm. um, we, we started working uh, with a pharma customer and we demonstrated he, we could make his very complex uh, molecule uh, by biosynthesis. And we started quickly started to generate turnover. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if I do a little bit of a lips in time, uh, eight years later, uh, we now achieve the end aim, initial aim, which is to serve the biggest industry leader um, in pharma, uh, cosmetic and ingredients. And, and I, one thing that I'm very proud of is that we grew with our market. So we barely raised no money uh, and uh, we are profitable since uh, basically since day one, um, which is, makes it quite unique. And, and the reason probably we're still here today is because we have served our clients well <laughs> and they come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's much easier when you have, uh, you know, client retention as opposed to having to find new clients all the time. Exactly. Uh, and I think we touch on some of these lessons you might have learned and, and advice for, you know, other biotech startups later on in this in this uh, interview. So that's very interesting. Um, you mentioned it a little bit back there, but when I when I was trying to understand what um, synthetic biology was. I, you know, obviously did some some research, and I came across an article that sort of always made me laugh a little bit, which said, "Ask a hundred scientists what synthetic biology is, and you'll get a hundred different answers." So I'm not sure I want to add to a hundred and one, but I'm going to ask you, uh, what is synthetic biology? Okay. Um... So I'm, I'm teaching synthetic biology myself in the university uh, to master students. So I also, of course, came with my own definition of it. Uh, my understanding of synthetic biology is uh, it's the science of creating a new complex function inside a living organism, okay? A function that uh, the organism naturally is not doing by himself. And this function could be a molecule, a biosensor, a, protect, a complex protein, an organelle, a lot of things, okay? Um, and more specifically, within the Synbio field, um, it, there is one playground that is called metabolic engineering. Um, and that at Abolis, we call biosynthesis uh, for the sake of clarity, for the sake of clarity. Uh, and this is the science of 
making a microbe that produces a chemical molecule. Okay, so it's subfraction of synbio. Uh, and uh, this molecule could be a natural molecule, uh, but the microbe that's never done before, or it could be a molecule that is even new to nature. Um, that is uh, what we call biosynthesis. Um, and when I try to explain it to, to non-technical people, I say, well, the job of Abolis is to turn an industrial microbe that eats sugar and make biomass or ethanol, and we turn it into a microbe that eats sugar and make the molecule that we want. It might be less enjoyable than ethanol, but <laughs> it is of the, our use and the, the use of our customer. And I think that's, that, that last sentence and sort of description that you gave is very nice and simple. And I think that's one of the challenges when I talk to people in this space um, who, who aren't necessarily talking to other scientists, they're talking to whether it be investors or partners or marketing people or business development people. And so the ability to explain something quite complex in a way that um, non-technical people can understand, like all communication, good communication is simple communication, but that's quite a challenge for this sector, I think. Yeah, certainly. But um, people don't necessarily have to understand the how as long as they understand the goal and what you make. So you make microbes that produce the molecule that you want to turn petrochemistry into a brewing industry. And that sounds nice to people and that's easy to understand. <laughs> people like brewing industries. Sure. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> they know the interest of it. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. And you mentioned, you know, right at the start of this episode, you mentioned about your customers coming to you with a specific need, and then you go away and, and come back to them and say how you can um, provide a solution to that need. But I'm, but I'm, I'm interested in what are the major challenges that your partners are facing? So maybe a little bit of a, a broader sort of challenge or a helicopter view challenge, especially when you're mentioning talking to a big um, personal care company. So what are those challenges and how are you helping them um, overcome them? So there are many challenges and many interests in going for biosynthesis, uh, but really depending on the industry, they do not emphasize or stress the same thing. Okay. Um, for instance, if you look at cosmetic, what the cosmetic industry, they are after bio-based products. Okay because they have a norm, which is called the ISO 16128, which helped them qualify this being bio-based as this is not being bio-based. So they want bio-based and sustainable product. They sometimes have supply chain issue. Um, and one last important thing, especially for the brand image uh, for sustainability is also to stop extracting rare, from rare resources from controversial country, okay? Whether it is palm oil or uh, a very rare plant somewhere on the Himalaya or Africa. Um, so they're really after like bio-based and image. Okay. Uh, when you, when you come to food ingredients, uh, or uh, FNF, what they, what they want is, is usually, uh, a, an illimited supply of a molecule that they could qualify as natural. Okay. Because when you produce a, a molecule within a microorganism, uh, and it is exactly the same as the natural source, it will be qualified as natural, okay? So when you have natural vanilla in your yogurt or natural or your ice cream, it, it's never, it has never seen a, a vanilla uh, plant, okay? Mm. Uh, but it's, it's labeled natural. And um, they also try to stay away from controversial cultures, okay? Um, but when you, when you come to chemistry, um, They'd like to access bio-based raw material to make bio-based plastic, biodegradable polymers, and they want to reduce their risk dependence on petrochemistry and price volatility of and, and geopolitical volatility of, uh, of petrochemicals. Um, and they also want to serve their image uh, for sustainability and selling a bio-based product is also handing over to their customer that will use the plastic beads or that will use the chemical ingredient to, to also label sustainable you know, his own uh, material. And when it comes to pharma, it's again a totally different game. Um, what they want usually is to be able to uh, access very complex senton, okay? 
um, to reduce the number of chemical steps that they have to make to manufacture the molecule and reduce their dependence to uh, China, India, or Bangladesh, um, which has uh, not so reliable quality uh, and, uh, and controllability. Uh, yeah, to be able to control their supply chain as well. And there is a new um, new thing that is coming recently, especially in the last two years, which is reshoring uh, the uh, manufacturing of the most essential drugs that we use. At least this is a very high tendency in Europe. And you can't reshore the production um, of certain chemistry in Europe because of the regulation. Um, so you'd like to, to develop a novel way to access your molecule with other symptoms and with another chemistry involved. So you see, uh, it all, it is all around sustainability, bio base and so on, but the stress and the way it is, uh, frame is not the same from industry to industry. Yeah, I think you, I think you've explained that brilliantly and you've also, um, you've also presented just the challenge that are facing these brands. You know, it's all very well and easy saying, you know, for the consumer or any sort of external pressure saying, you know, you must reduce your environmental footprint, which of course they must, but there's not a magic wand uh, to do this. And it, you know, and it, as you say, it changes from, from sector to sector. Um, and so having the wider view of how changing something impacts that supply chain and moving um, sourcing of raw materials or production from certain um, countries that maybe are not as stable as others are sometimes things that we, you know, we haven't really talked about that much on BMI TV, to be honest. We focused on how do we replace X with something which is less damaging to the planet. Occasionally we talk about societal impact, but, but not much wider than that. So it's quite interesting to get that view. Wow, it's a complex question. I'll do my best to, <laughs> to answer that in, in a few words. But uh, yeah, there's a bit of mixing in the population, um, especially public communication between what is bio-based, what is natural, what is biodegradable, what is sustainable, um, and what is basically desirable as a society. Um, it, it would be it would take a lot of time to go in, in over each and every of these aspects. Uh, but if I if I try to sum up briefly, I would say that um, first the advantage of biosynthesis is that you can achieve comparable uh, scalability than you can get with petrochemistry, um, and, and that you cannot get with natural extraction. But if you extract natural resources, uh, you have renewable material, okay, because it's 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 taken from um, from CO2 and light um, by opposition to extracting resources from underneath and, and release it in the atmosphere. And I feel biosynthesis really combines this, like the scalability in making industrially viable to produce um, chemicals, um, and it could be as renewable as natural extraction. They kind of combine uh, the advantage of both worlds, um, I feel. And, uh, and for me, um, if you look at if you look it back and, and step back and, and, and look a bit broader, uh, biosynthesis is probably one of the few, if not uh, the only one, um, that can really help us as a human being and as a chemist to close the cycle of carbon. Okay, um, and uh, we shall be very careful that the chemical that we make are actually biodegradable and and do not have the same hazard as the chemicals that we once made. Uh, but we could technically engineer safe, um, safe by design molecules, okay, which have a low remanence in the environment um, and uh, that are made from biobase and that are biodegradable. So closing the loop of, of carbon. One, uh, one thing that I like to stress, and I, I think it will exemplify uh, with uh, together with uh, AgroParisTech and, uh, and a major uh, partner, uh, we develop a bio-based sunscreen, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's bio-based, biodegradable, non-endocrine disruptor. It's a novel molecule, but it is as efficient as the petrochemical ones, even more efficient, okay? And the remnants in the environment is 10 days, something like this, just in water. So it, it shows that it is possible to make equivalent functionality with novel molecules, uh, which are designed to be more sustainable. 
from their structure to the way they're produced to the way they're used. Great, thank you. I think that um, I've talked to a few guests uh, around those um, alternative ingredients, chemicals and materials, and the fact that they have to uh, be as good at performing or outperforming the incumbent um, petrochemical based um, sort of product, if you like. I think you just answered my, my next question. Um, and that was sort of around, you know, when people talk about sustainability, they tend to think that natural equals sustainable. Um, but you don't always think this is the case. And you, you, you talked a little bit there about how biosynthesis is, is proving to be a solid alternative to both less sustainable petrochemical processes and also, which I don't think you touched on too much, tropical plant extraction methods um, for sourcing those much needed molecules. So is there anything, anything there that you just wish to, to add to? I think we covered it. Yeah, yeah I, think <laughs> I don't know. I, no, I could speak for hours, but <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to stay within the, the time frame. That you, you <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you're right. So and can you summarize for me then the biosynthesis process that Abolith yeah. implements in order to transform sugars into a specific molecule? Yeah, so it's a, it's a several steps process, okay? Um, so what you want to is to implement within the microorganism a set of chemical transformation, okay? This chemical transformation, they're driven by enzymes. So the first step is to identify the enzymes that you need, okay? Um, so you identify these enzymes in nature, uh, in the literature, uh, but sometimes this en enzymes does not even exist. So you take a natural enzyme and you re-engineer it so that it catalyzes the reaction that you want. And you have to do this for each and every step of your chemical synthesis, okay? Um, so that's step number one. Uh, then step number two is to find the right microorganism to catalyze uh, your transformation. Um, why? At Abolis, we use a different strain for each and every process that we make. We don't believe that there is one strain that does everything, okay? Um, you shall find an industrial microorganism that already scales, okay, that you already know that you can produce at scale, for which the product is non-toxic, uh, which is resistant to industrial stress, which can grow on a very cheap medium. Uh, it's not always possible. We should try as much as possible to find that. Uh, and uh, and then you have to be able to engineer the strain. Okay, so that's that's the different criteria. So finding an enzyme, finding the microorganism, and then you have to make the transplant. Okay, transplant all those genes to have a stable expression. Um, you have to make the strain very resistant to uh, genetic drift. What we call genetic drift is the fact that by reproducing itself, the microbe, they they tend to lose the genes that you have implanted inside. So you have to make sure they do not evade what you want them to produce. Um, and then you have to make sure that the transplant seamlessly uh, is, is getting integrated in the metabolism, okay? Um, so that this new function works well with the existing function. And if there are some things that you need to turn off or turn up, then this, there comes the time for optimization. So you try to debottleneck certain parts of the flux Okay, of the transformation flux. You try to shut down several products uh, if, if you get some side products that you don't need. Uh, so that's step number three. Step number four is really to, to play with all these little uh, um, elements to try to optimize, develop a fermentation process that will meet your tighter yield and rate, which are required for industrial production. And then you get a, a fermentation growth, you have your bacteria, they have produced the product inside and you have to get the product out of that water. And that is called downstream process, DSP. Um, so this is step number five is really to develop this DSP, okay? Um, it may look like a sequential process, but in fact, it's not. Because if you, if you do it step by step, then you're probably gonna take ages first. And second, you may realize that there is a problem at step number five that you can only fix at step number one. So it's actually a continuous iterative process where you have several generations of strain and several generations of processes until you get to the process that you need to be able to scale up. And then, of course, the following step is scaling up. 
<laughs> the easy bit <laughs> thank you for that i wanted to i want to just t sort of take us off 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 track a little bit um and when i when i talk to people in this sector it's it's impossible to have a conversation without talking about the importance of ideation and collaboration um, and I see on your website that you openly invite companies to brainstorm ideas with you. So what does this process look like and feel like and why is it so important to your business? So it is very important that we, we have content discussion, okay? Uh, when you are an industrial, it's always good to claim, yeah, I want to be sustainable, I want to be that, I want to do that. But really the... Uh, the game begins at the moment we say, okay, what if we do that? Okay. Uh, and for this, we need to, to sit down, have a content discussion. What are your problems? Are these problems could be met with the current technology? Can we meet this problem with biosynthesis and so on? So that this is really the idea of the starting of ideation. And then eventually you end up with one molecule or family of molecule that we would like to address. Okay. Then you need to be are uh, able to really do a 360 evaluation of, of, of this idea, okay? So you shall look at the literature, that's obvious. You shall look at all the patents, because maybe others have field patents and you may have encountered difficulty in doing it. You shall look at the economics. You simulate, uh, we are able to simulate the key economics of a process to see whether it flies economically. Um, there you have to, um, to evaluate what would be the different steps that you would need to get to the end and imagine what would be the intermediate milestone and KPI that you have to reach to prove that you are actually progressing. And then you make a calculation of return on investment, okay? Um, and then you get a complete business case. Okay, I wanna make this molecule, I know how, I know what I can protect, I know where the difficulty is gonna be and so on, and how much I'm gonna invest and how much time you're gonna take. Okay, then you go to the decision uh, makers um, and uh, you say, okay, I, we believe we shall invest in that process and we will or not. And sometimes they are, the customer are disappointed. We say no for a very good reason. They say, are you sure? Yes, we're sure. Uh, but uh, this is extremely important for us uh, because if we pass this first filter in so far over the last year of uh, operation, we never, we always met our KPIs on time, on scope and on budget. So we make a very strong commitment. I, I, I can't say it will never happen, but so in so far, we managed all the KPIs in the milestone we have set. So it's, it's very important that we go through this uh, pre-filtering, okay, to avoid failure. Um, and it, it's, it's okay to fail if you have invested uh, 50,000. So it's not okay to fail if you have invested 5 million, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a different, uh, different game here. Um, is that answering your, your yeah, question? Abs absolutely. And it leads me on to my, my very last question, actually, as we, I think, yeah, we, it leads on to my last question as we come towards the end of this episode. Um, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and, and ask for one piece of advice, okay, that you would give to um, biotech startups in order for them to improve their chance of survival. So you've been going for eight years, you've been very successful, no doubt you've had some bumps in the road. So what one piece of advice would you would you give to, to somebody else? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you start, we are all enthusiasts and we all want to change the world and we all believe that we can make it, okay? Uh, <laughs> otherwise, there is no entrepreneurship. OK, uh, but uh, we usually are specialists in the technology that we, that we master or we think we master uh, because life is always more difficult than we saw. Uh, and, uh, and we have this uh, innovative spirit and sometimes have the technology or have a very good idea of the technology uh, we want to develop. Then comes the hard time. First, you have to uh, kind of build the structure, the company, the platform, making all the people working together uh, with different jobs, like coming from IP to technical engineers, to electronician, maybe to biologists, to analytical chemists. You have to make these people working together. And because they, as an entrepreneur, you have all in your brain, it's actually very difficult to make the brain of other people 
uh, really match. And, and speaking with uh, CEOs and, and CTOs of uh, other companies in the field, they all suffered this very long uh, setup of their team and uh, and uh, setting up the, the framework, the collaboration framework for it to work efficiently in the company. Um, so that's extremely important, but I would say that's your own business, okay? That's not what the customer expects from you. The customer, they expect uh, that you're able to collaborate with them, okay? And to be able to collaborate with a major industry, um, you shall not be just uh, two kids in, a, in an office, okay? You have to structure um, your, your collaboration process. Um, so you need a project management framework. Um, you need to uh, really be clear on what you want to achieve, the KPIs, the milestone. Um, and it took me like three years probably to, to, to turn my startup into a SME that was actually capable of collaborating with major uh, groups and have several projects. You have to set up the framework, you have to initiate uh, the customer centric mindset uh, of your own team um, and, and set up a service that is considered as being very professional. And uh, it took me like five to six years to get to that. Um, and uh, yeah, so be good at what you do, uh, but be professional on what you sell. That's probably the two main difficulties, whatever business you, you try to build. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, that's, there's, there's a whole nother episode on, you know, small business survival to scale up and that sort of stuff. But I completely agree, you know, have that structure, ha have the structure if you can from day one of what you want to be in a number of years down the line, because that will serve you, serve you very well. So thank you for that. Excellent, excellent um, piece of piece of insight. So um, Cyril, thank you very much for your time. Um, just quickly, before we end this episode, I'd just like to invite any collaborative bio pioneers um, to please feel free to contact me at paul at biomarketinsights.com and let's explore what we can do together. Um, Cyril, that pretty much wraps up our conversation. So on behalf of myself and our viewers from around the world, just really like to thank you for your insights and your time. And uh, I wish you all the very best for the future and, and hopefully I'll see you soon. Thank you, Paul. See you soon. Absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot, Cyril. Bye-bye.